we are on our third session of our QHN OSH webinar series. Like what been, we've been saying in our posters, so when we when we send this out to you guys, uh, all employees are technically required to attend this because this is part of the must bees and the must haves by uh, our friends from Dole, of course. And of course, it gives us more information about the different illnesses, no in. Uh, possibly in the workplace. So again, welcome to the session three title, entitled Ending the Stigma, Living and Working with HIV. Ayan. So it's a very, very sensitive subject. However, because of our speakers and our moderators and our guest doctors today, um, Let's remove our inhibitions and let's just ask kung meron tayong mga katanungan. But if you are um, also not very confident in asking it, um, you can naman uh, ask, uh, ask us and post us uh, directly the questions so we can say, send it to our doctors. All right. So to start the day, so um, again, everybody, may I request everyone if you can change your names uh, to start with your SBU so we can see um, the attendance also from uh, the SBUs. All right, so please uh, identify yourselves from what SBU you come from. All right, so to start the session, may I introduce to you our uh, the man from Iloilo, our chief operating officer from Qualimed Iloilo to do our welcome remarks, Dr. Nathaniel H. Chan or Dr. Apple. Good afternoon, Dr. Apple. Hello, Bambi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. So good afternoon also to everyone in the call. So Team Qualimed, uh, maayong hapon. Congratulate the organizers of this Occupational Safety and Health Webinar Series. This is already our third session and uh, I believe that each topic is becoming more and more meaningful and relevant to all of us. So today's topic, Ending the Stigma, Living and Working with HIV, is by far the most sensitive topic that uh, we have. No? So as healthcare workers, it is very important that we should have the basic knowledge when it comes to infectious diseases such as HIV. So there are still a lot of misconceptions on, on HIV AIDS. Uh, we have to realize that not all cases of HIV are sexually transmitted. So when I was doing my fellowship in a children's hospital in the United States uh, many, many years ago, uh, I saw a lot of HIV cases that are congenital in nature. And yet these children will grow up to face the same stigma associated with uh, the disease. So therefore, as healthcare workers, uh, we should be at the forefront in ending the stigma and the discrimination that these people with HIV are facing. So I hope that through this webinar, with the help of our, of course, of our infectious disease experts, Dr. Uh, Monica Montesilio and uh, Dr. Mark Pasayan, we will all be equipped with more knowledge about HIV and how to deal with people living with HIV with compassion, of course, one of our uh, core values. values. So the QualiMed Health Network will become a safe haven for all of them. So let us all sit back, relax, and uh, listen to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Apple. Medyo tinamaan ng puso ko doon sa... <laughs> Let us be compassionate no, for people with HIV kasi syempre nga hindi naman talaga sexually transmitted ang cause natin. No? So thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Dr. Apple. And of course, uh, to introduce our... Uh, very special speaker for this afternoon. Let me give you our doctor from DMMC. Ayan, talk in una ko DMMC. But also, he also practices in STR, our uh, baby hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, Team Qualimet to introduce our speaker, doc, our chair for the Infection Prevention and Control Council of Qualimet Health Network, Dr. Mark Christopher Yu Pasayan. Dr. Uh, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Qualimed Health Network. And thank you, Bambi, for that introduction. Nakalimutan mo yata yung Star Magic um, <laughs> contract star. Anyway. Sorry naman, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, again, this is uh, like what the Bambi said. No, This is the third of the series of webinar webinars 
um, initiated by the Qualimed Health Network, Occupational Safety and Health. And uh, we are very much privileged to have a very distinguished speaker, uh, resource speaker this afternoon to talk about HIV in the workplace. You know, um, as an HIV doctor myself, I consider the HIV as a forgotten epidemic uh, because of the COVID-19. And we've seen the rise and fall and another rise of the HIV cases in the country as the effect of uh, this COVID-19. And um, a lot of us are, uh, uh, are affected uh, by this HIV epidemic, especially those who are in the healthcare profession. So to introduce our, um, our guest, our, guest, our resource speaker, um, our speaker for today is Dr. Monica Pia Reyes Montesilio. She's a practicing internist and infectious disease specialist. She's a graduate of the UP College of Medicine and an internship in the Philippine General Hospital. She had her residency training at the St. Luke's Medical Center Global City and the Infectious Disease Fellowship Training at the Philippine General Hospital. She's a member of several local and international uh, professional societies. And aside from the Polymed Hospital Santa Rosa, she also practices in several hospitals in Laguna. Let's all welcome our IDS, the Monica Pia Reyes Montesilio. Over Good to you. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Doc Mark, for that. Thank you, Doc. We're good. We can see your slide very well. Okay. All right. So today we'll be discussing again the HIV in the workplace. Okay, so the number of people living with HIV in the Philippines continue to increase at an alarming rate. The risk of HIV infection among healthcare workers is mitigated by the availability of post-exposure prophylaxis and personal protective equipment that prevent injuries from sharp medical devices. However, it must be noted that healthcare workers may also be exposed to HIV through other routes such as unprotected vaginal sex and anal sex among others. So again, thank you to the QualiMed Health Network Occupational Safety and Health for organizing this webinar. So by the end of this uh, webinar, we shall be able to uh, give an update on the current status of HIV in the Philippines to discuss issues on HIV related to testing, confidentiality, and discrimination in the workplace, and to enumerate steps on the management of needle stick injury. So with that, this will be the outline of my lecture. So in February 2020, this is the latest published data. There were 1,054 confirmed HIV positive individuals reported to the HIV AIDS and ART Registry of the Philippines or HARP. This averages 33 new HIV cases per day. So this accounts to the total of 96,266 reported cases since January of 1984. 95% of the reported cases for the month of February were male. 5% were females. Moreover, 28% of the individuals um, in February had already advanced infection, uh, 152 based on immunologic uh, criterion, meaning the CD4 is less than 200, and the other 145 is based on clinical criteria, meaning there's presence of opportunistic infections seen in patients with CD4 less than 200. So of the total reported cases during uh, February, 60% were cisgender, 3% uh, were transgender women, 25% uh, identify their gender neither as, as man or women. So this, this is also an interesting topic. No? Soji, soji, or sexual orientation and gender identity expression, is another interesting topic to be discussed, no? but we cannot discuss it at this time. So further, 50% of the cases were 25 to 34 years old at the time of the diagnosis. 30% were 15 to 24. 18% were 35 to 49. 2% were 50 years and older. So previously, while I was in PGH uh, doing my internship, I actually had a newly diagnosed HIV patient who's 60 years old, uh, sorry, 70 years old. 
And then, as mentioned by Dr. Apple, no, there's also 1% who's less than 15 years old. So this is usually from vertical transmission, meaning mother-to-child transmission. So for the cases for February and same as the previous months, the median age was 28 years old. As we can see, NCR and Calabarzon already accounts for 52% of newly diagnosed cases. And of the total reported cases, 99 were transmitted through sexual contact. Less than 1% were reported to be acquired through sharing of needles and less than 1% through mother-to-child transmission. So, um, so also, uh, there were 861 people with HIV who were initiated in February on ART. All were, of course, first-line regimen. Their median CD4 upon enrollment is 231. So uh, let's make this a little bit interactive. I think Dr. Pasayan has some cases. Yes. So um, <laughs> we plan to have this uh, an interactive session between me and Dr. Montesilio. So I'll present some cases and I'd like to ask Dr. Montesilio for her comments and um, the several issues that uh, we might encounter when we when we see these cases, especially sa, sa ating HR or sa, sa ating mga healthcare workers who will be um, faced with several issues regarding HIV. So this case one is regarding pre-employment HIV testing. We have a 20-year-old female who's applying as a customer sales representative. She was required by the HR to undergo HIV screening, but the patient was hesitant, so she consulted an ID for uh, an opinion. Dr. Monica, so what's the uh, protection? Uh, regarding uh, mandatory HIV testing for Filipino uh, Filipinos who would uh, who are applying a job here in the Philippines. Okay, so we have the Republic Act of one one six six and RA of uh, eighty five zero four to guide us with HIV issues. So we know that the HIV and AIDS are public health concerns that have that have wide-ranging social, political, and economic repercussions. So responding to the country's HIV and AIDS situation is therefore imbued with public interest and shall be anchored on the principles of human rights, upholding human dignity. So the state shall always respect, protect, and promote human rights as cornerstones of an effective response to the country's HIV and AIDS situation. Hence, HIV and AIDS education, information dissemination should form part the right to health. So uh, let's just go through some definition of terms. And these were all lifted no, from uh, the Republic Act 11166. So what's HIV testing? HIV testing refers to any facility-based mobile medical procedure or community-based screening modalities that are conducted to determine the presence or absence of HIV in a person's body. So HIV testing is confidential voluntary in nature and must be accompanied by counseling prior to and after the testing and conducted only with the informed consent of the person. So voluntary HIV testing refers to the testing done on an individual who, after having undergone pre-test counseling, willingly submits to such tests. So another, uh, some, some more terms to define, provider-initiated counseling and testing, or PICT. This refers to a healthcare provider initiating HIV testing to a person practicing high-risk behavior or vulnerable to HIV after conducting HIV pretest counseling. So a person may elect to decline or defer the testing such that consent is conditional. So pretest counseling, uh, as it um, already um gives away, it refers to the process of providing an individual with information on the biomedical aspects of HIV and emotional support to any psychological impl implications of undergoing uh, HIV testing and the test result itself before the individual is subjected to the test. And post-test counseling is something that we do after um, for risk reduction information, emotional support, regardless of the results. So whether the result is positive or negative, we do post-test counseling. So again, this uh, reiterates that HIV testing shall be encouraged to everyone, but it should be voluntary and with written consent. So below, I'll just summarize that. It's um, so these slides are heavy. So 
if you are more than 18 years old, then you can give your consent, of course, because you're already of legal age. But if you are 15 to 18 years old, you may also give the consent already, especially if you are pregnant or you engage in high-risk behaviors. So you need consent from a parent or a guardian if you're less than 15 or you are mentally incapacitated. So again, uh, this reiterates the importance of proper counseling to be conducted. So we've already, um, so these are just uh, some, some cases where HIV testing is compulsory. Number one, if it's necessary to test a person who is charged with serious and slight physical injuries, such as rape, simple seduction, uh, it's also necessary when it's relevant um, to resolve some issues of the family uh, code of the Philippines. And of course, it's a prerequisite to uh, in, in the donation of blood. So we've seen some patients already who were diagnosed during blood transfusion. So these usually are... Uh, um, our asymptomatic HIV patients. So again, uh, HIV testing may be done both in public and private um, testing facilities. There should be guidelines for HIV counseling and testing for all the institutions uh, doing the HIV test. Again, um, very important, informed consent is voluntary and um, confidential. Uh, the HIV counselors should coordinate with DSWD, also with the National Council for Disability Affairs, uh, because um, these differently abled persons are taken advantage of. So uh, before, I already had a patient who was actually uh, deaf. No? So, you know, these are patients who are very prone to... Um, discrimination and abuse. So we get patients who are differently abled and with HIV. Again, no te HIV testing shall be conducted without informed consent. Therefore, it must be noted that HIV antibody testing must be voluntary and cannot be a requirement for consideration for employment in the Philippines. It is considered unlawful under the RA 5, uh, 8504 or the Philippines AIDS Prevention and Control Act of 1998 to perform compulsory HIV testing as a prerequisite for employment or admission to an educational institution. Therefore, for case number one, there's no indication to do a compulsory HIV testing for pre-employment. Buck Mark? <laughs> yeah, so um, for local employment, um, some, some companies kasi, uh, I'm not saying Qualimed, no, but some companies uh, are requiring their employees for an HIV test. So based uh, in accordance uh, to our Republic Act 111.66, which is the AIDS uh, law, um, mandatory uh, or compulsory HIV testing is unlawful. However, kung tayo mag-apply sa ibang bansa, uh, definitely we need to comply with the laws of that country where we are applying. Um, okay, so let's go to our second case. This is, this is a case of a 25-year-old male who's a dialysis nurse and was recently admitted for severe pneumonia. She, oh, he admitted to have multiple sexual partners, no history of needle prick injuries or IV drug use. Um, physician initiated uh, counseling and testing uh, for HIV was done, which turned out that he's HIV positive with a CD4 of 100. Dr. Monica, how do we deal with this uh, PLHIV uh, healthcare worker? Is he required to inform the HR uh, his supervisor or his nursing colleague, and even his patients, uh, that he is HIV positive. Number two, shall he be removed from work uh, or from the company or from the hospital where he is working? And uh, number three, shall he be reassigned to another unit? Remember, this is a dialysis nurse. So the, the, there is the risk of, quote unquote, exposure to other patients. Okay, so let's go back to the Republic Act 11166. No, some definition of terms again. What's medical confidentiality? This refers to the core duty of medical practice where the information provided by the patient to healthcare practitioners and his or her status is kept private and is not divulged to third parties. The patient's health status can, however, be shared with other medical practitioner involved in the professional care of the patient who will also be bound by 
display medical confidentiality. So this applies to attending physician, consulting medical specialist, nurse, medical technologist, and other healthcare workers or personnel involved in any counseling, testing, or professional care of the patient. So this applies to any person who is in any official capacity has acquired or may have acquired such confidential information. Again, for PLHIV uh, healthcare workers, education in the workplace is very important. So our institutions, hopefully, uh, just like this, no, like webinars like this to educate our um, employees, our staff, and our colleagues on how to handle and what to do, uh, especially because, you know, no matter what we say, there's still very high discrimination um, uh, towards the PLHIV. Especially, maybe, if it's a healthcare worker. So, just another provision from the, Repub the, the HIV law is that the PhilHealth shall develop a benefit package for PLHIV. So, we actually have the PhilHealth OHAT, or the Outpatient HIV AIDS Treatment Package, no? where we have uh, the PhilHealth would... Um, uh, provide the medicines for ART. So most of the ARTs are really subsidized by the government. You cannot buy them over the counter. No? It's not um, available um, right and left in different drugstores. Yeah. So this one, uh, I think this is something that should be heard louder. No, uh, This AIDS law actually states that no PLHIV shall be denied or deprived uh, private health insurance under an HMO and private life insurance coverage under life insurance companies. So actually up to now, to be honest, I'm sure Dr. Mark agrees, we still get patients who are actually um, discriminated by HMOs and or life insurances or sometimes it depends kasi on, on their policies. Some would cover um, sexually transmitted infection, some naman wala. No? Okay, so again, confidentiality and privacy of PLHIV, especially if it's a healthcare worker, shall always be guaranteed. And um, these are just some of the exceptions uh, where the confidential HIV AIDS information may be released. No? Number one, reportorial requirements, like the one of the few slides that I shown earlier. No, these are so we report them, but the by numbers. But we do not, um, we keep the identity of these people um, still confidential. So just numbers for census purposes, epidemiologic purposes. Also, when informing again other healthcare workers directly involved in the treatment of the PLHIV. And for some court issues, no, um, it may be uh, ex exempted. So what are duties of our employers, so, um, such as Qualimed Health Network, we should promulgate rules and regulations prescribing the procedure for investigation should there be any discrimination cases and the administrative sanctions thereof. So we should create an ad hoc committee on the investigation of discrimination cases, and we shall conduct meetings to increase the members' knowledge and understanding of HIV and AIDS and to prevent incidents of information, which is what we're doing now. All right, so um, again, uh, discrimination is uh, prohibited. But actually, uh, PSMID, so our society, released this guideline. This was in 2017 as a guide for managing HIV-infected uh, healthcare workers. So the main objective of this um, CPG is to provide an ethical and legal framework in managing PLHIV healthcare workers, balancing the rights and safety of both the patient and the healthcare provider. So here, uh, current evidence actually supports the conclusion that the risk of HIV transmission from an infected HIV uh, healthcare worker to a patient is very low. It's estimated to be 2.4 to 24 per 1 million procedures. And the risk of HIV transmission from an infected and untreated healthcare worker to a patient still is extremely low for most invasive procedures and negligible for less invasive procedures. So in the U.S., actually, the CDC conducted a study of more than 22,000 patients treated by 64 HIV-infected healthcare workers, and laboratory and epidemiologic analysis did not reveal any healthcare worker-associated transmission of HIV.
So although the documented uh, healthcare risk for HIV is low, a standard stratification of risk associated with each medical or surgical procedure is still important when drafting recommendations for uh, HIV-infected healthcare workers. So we use this um, uh, categorization no, to classify medical surgical procedures depending on the risk of transmission. This is for all bloodborne viruses such as HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, from the healthcare worker to the patient. So for category one, these are for medical procedures where the likelihood of viral transmission is deemed negligible. This is when the anatomical site of the procedure is either superficial with minimal involvement of sharps or does not involve sharps at all. The surgical field and the physician or the healthcare, healthcare worker's hands are visible at all times. So history taking, standard uh, medical examination where there is no risk for blood-to-blood -blood contact between the healthcare worker and the patient is under category one. So for category two, these are procedures where viral transmission from healthcare worker to the patient is unlikely, but theoretically not impossible. And the risk of blood-to-blood -blood contact between the physician and or the healthcare worker and the patient is minimal. This would involve surgeries where the operative field and the healthcare worker's hands are well visualized, no deep spaces are reached, except when using devices such as catheters and scopes. And for category three, this is what we call PP or exposure prone procedures where the healthcare worker transmission has been previously documented. So this would include surgeries that are extensive, would involve deep cavities where the healthcare worker's fingers and the sharp instruments are simultaneously present in a poorly visualized or highly confined anatomic site. So um, aside from the inherent risk of the uh, medical procedures, no, the healthcare workers' viral load um, so it's also something that would affect transmissibility. But this is the list of the category three. I'll just run through them quickly. Uh, trauma surgery, orthopedic, cardiothoracic surgery, open extensive head and neck surgeries, dental procedures, neurosurgery, hysterectomy, CS, open abdominal and pelvic surgeries, organ transplantation, thyroidectomy. Yeah. So yeah, as mentioned earlier, the healthcare workers' viral load um, is something also that we should take into consideration. And actually, for the WHO, they currently recommend that if a healthcare worker would is HIV positive and would like to uh, do uh, exposure-prone procedures, their CD4 should be more than 350 or viral load less than 500. So for all healthcare workers, of course, it's very important to initiate early uh, antiretroviral therapies to as to reduce uh, progression to AIDS and decrease mortality. So although testing is not mandatory by law, all healthcare workers should be counseled on the importance of knowing one's HIV status. So healthcare workers, especially those involved in EPPs or the Category 3 procedures, are ethically bound to seek HIV testing as soon as they have been exposed to HIV occupationally or through other means. Of course, we cannot discount the fact hindi naman porket healthcare worker tayo lagi nating, mag, or magiging excuse natin that we got HIV from our occupation, no? because the reality is still, we of course can get it uh, sexually. So appropriate medical and occupational support should be provided once we find out that we have a healthcare worker who is infected with HIV. So uh, the uh, employer should organize a health management team to ensure patient safety and provide support to the infected uh, healthcare workers. So this is the team. Usually we have an attending physician. Uh, it, it's not necessary that you have an ID specialist. Not all hospitals have ID specialists. We have the HIPPO or the Hospital Infection Prevention Control Committee and the HAC team, no? the HIV team. So it's the, the role of the physician. It's the responsibility of the physician, the attending physician, to of course evaluate the clinical status of the infected healthcare workers worker, uh, which includes the viral load, uh, update uh, she, the attending physician shall coordinate with the HIPPO and the HAC no, regarding the status of the healthcare workers. And everything, of course, shall be done uh, in confidence. So the HIPCO shall be the one to assess the procedures that the healthcare workers may perform safely 
as well as his or her adherence to the accepted infection uh, control procedures or precaution. It will be uh, the responsible all, uh, responsibility of also of the HIPCO to always uh, watch out for patient exposure, shall inform the Office of the Deputy Director uh, for the number of infected HIV. So you, the HIPCO doesn't need to tell the director, for example, the identity of the HIV infected healthcare worker. So the HIPCO shall just uh, report how many healthcare workers have HIV. So, and the HACT, of course, is responsible for ensuring that the healthcare worker has access to the antiretroviral medicines. And there is, of course, proper counseling. The HACT is all, uh, also ensures that the hospital has access to post exposure prophylaxis. I will discuss that later in the event that a patient is exposed to um, HIV, uh, an HIV uh, patient. So again, the infected healthcare worker may perform any medical procedure except the EPP or Category 3. So ideally, he must be on a regular ART and have a viral load of less than uh, 500. So when do we give a uh, fit to work? No? So it's ideal that the healthcare worker has uh, appropriate immune reconstitution without OIs or at least treated controlled OIs with CD4 of more than 350. And if the if there we see some patients who despite taking ARTs for months or sometimes even years, ni talaga tumataas yung CD4 nila. So it's the judgment na of the attending physician to recommend if the healthcare worker is already fit to work. No? So, uh, iba iba ang pagtaas, there's no formula for the increase of CD4. So, um, he or she may also offer options for the healthcare workers to be assigned to a specific hospital section or ward or to recommend that it's safe for the healthcare workers to perform EPP. So, for example, for this, um, for our case, for case two, the one mentioned by Dr. Pasaya, no? newly diagnosed. Um, dialysis nurse. So for the meantime, um, we can reassign the, the nurse, no? especially mababa yung CD4. But of course, ideally, the CD4 should be higher na before we fit to work the patient. So the HIPCO should also provide clearance for to perform EPP based on the recommendations of the attending physician and available availability of laboratory results. So again, like what I mentioned earlier, should a Healthcare workers, especially for surgeons, no, uh, if they really want to do um, EPPs, then um, ideally they should have a viral load of already more uh, less than 500. And disclosure. So for disclosure, the healthcare workers who are newly diagnosed or previously diagnosed with HIV are not obliged to disclose to the hospital or to the workplace their HIV status. But of course, it's encouraged that he or she informs at least the HIPCO and the HACT. No? So because you know, providing um, healthcare services is a two-way relationship. So both for the safety of our patients and the healthcare providers should always be considered. Okay, so to answer, is he required? Yung question kasi required eh. Required to inform HR, the supervisors, mga friends niya sa, ano, sa station or yung patients niya. So no. But it's encouraged again that he or she uh, informs the hip ko and the hack. Or they may nagbabantay and nagsusupport sa kanya. Shall he be removed from work? Of course, not. No, again, there's small risk of HIV transmission to the patient, and the inherent human rights of healthcare workers should also always be promulgated. Shall he be reassigned in another unit? Again, uh, because the patient is a dialysis nurse, so that's category mga one to two, because it's superficial if they would um if, if, if of course they handle sharps, handling catheters, fistula, no, so mga one to two. Um, for as long as the patient is already started on ARVs no OIs or controlled OIs, and the CD4 is more than 350 or at least once cleared by HIPCO, then there are dialysis nerds can go back to work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica, for answering those questions. And um, to just to for the information of everybody, we're just not talking about um, the, the, the healthcare workers who are in the, uh, the clinic or in the clinical field. No, we're also talking about other, um, healthcare workers, like in the admin offices. So this applies to all, um, siguro ang pinaka, uh, essence nung, nung message ni Dr. Monica is that, um, 
being on PLHIV or having HIV is not the reason for you not to continue your profession as a healthcare uh, professional. And uh, it, whether you are a surgeon, a nurse, a med tech, an admin officer, um, uh, you have the rights uh, to, to, to continue your profession. And also it's all your prerogative whether you would like to disclose this to your employer or not. And uh, siguro ang protection lang natin dito while you are or the, the, the person is immunocompromised, um, we need additional protection because you are working in a healthcare facility and you are exposed also to other infections. Okay, so um, hopefully we'll get other questions from uh, the participants regarding this case later. But uh, we'll proceed to case number three. This is a, an occupational exposure naman to an HIV patient. No? Uh, this is a 35-year-old female nurse who sustained a needle stick injury after recapping an ID catheter. So the, I think this is a large bore needle pag ID catheter, is it? <laughs> and uh, on workup, they, they found out that the source patient is HEP negative, but HIV positive. Ayun. Pinawisan na ng malagkit ang nurse at nagdasal na ng, ng uh, 10 Hail Marys dahil HIV positive pala yung needle stick niya. So what shall this um, female nurse, uh, dialysis nurse, oh, no, no, a female nurse would do, Dr. Monica? Okay, so the question is, syempre, yun nga, sabi mo, pinawisan na yung female nurse, no? What is the risk of infection after an occupational exposure? So if the healthcare personnel who have received hepatitis B vaccine and develop immunity to the virus are virtually uh, at no risk of getting the infection, no? but for a susceptible person, the risk of a single needle stick or cut exposure to a hepatitis B infected blood ranges from 60 to 30%. It would depend on the hepatitis B E antigen status of the source individual. So if the uh, if the if the patient is HBE, uh, sorry, HBSAG positive with HBEAG positive, they have more virus in their blood and are more likely to transmit the Hep B virus than those who are HBEAG negative. So while there is risk of uh, for HBV infection from exposures of mucous membranes or not intact skin, there is no known risk uh, for HBV infection from exposure to intact skin. So it's really very important. Um, I think all hospitals naman would check the hepatitis B status of the patient. Uh, the nurses no and if if it's not if it's low non-reactive for example uh you anti hbs you can give them uh, vaccines no so uh so it's high so hepatitis b is 6 to 30 for hep c naman it's low it's 1 to 8 percent and for hiv it's actually lower pa is there 0.3 percent only so um this means that uh to state it in another way, it's like 99.7% of needle stick injury cuts uh, do not lead to HIV infection. Okay, so uh, the risk of occupational HIV transmission varies by the type of exposure. If these are splashes by body fluid, it's near zero, even if the fluid have blood in them. If, there, uh, if these are fluid splashes to intact skin or mucous membrane, again, it's extremely low, even if blood is involved. And as mentioned earlier, if it's percutaneous or needle stick injury, it's actually a 1%. So... Um, only 58 cases of confirmed occupational HIV transmission to healthcare personnel have been reported in the United States. No? So how can we prevent occupational HIV transmission? So dito na pumapasok yung mga infection control and prevention measures natin. So of course, we always follow standard precaution at all times. No, uh, Assume that all uh, blood and other bodily fluids are potentially infectious. So we use gloves, goggles, and other barriers when anticipating uh, contact with blood or body fluid. We wash our hands and other skin surfaces immediately after contact with blood or body fluids. We should be careful when handling and disposing sharps during and after use. So parang kanina kasi nag-recap siya. So dapat diba, hindi tayo mag-recap. So use safety devices to prevent needle stick injuries and we dispose them in the proper sharps containers. So of course, in 
dapat very, it's very visible, always available yung Sharps containers natin. And don't be shy, ha, to report or don't be scared to report a needle stick injury. So, minsan, yan yung nagiging hesitation kasi, ay, nako, mapapagalitan ako ni Doc. Mapapagalitan ako ng hip ko nurse kasi nag-recap ako. But don't think about that, no? You should report needle, all needle stick injuries or kung hindi ka sure nasugatan ka, nakat yung gloves mo, you report it to um, the hip ko. Because um, if you're exposed to HIV, the clock is ticking. So what do we do? So we have what we call post-exposure prophylaxis. I have been mentioning this earlier. Uh, this is a medicine that you take before you get sick. So this is recommended for healthcare personnel potentially exposed to HIV. So this should be initiated as soon as possible, within hours if possible. Of course, we still um, assess no, your eligibility uh, to this. We assess if there's really high risk of exposure. Uh, we test both. Ideally, no, we test we ideally were able to test both the patient who had the needle stick injury and the source patient. And of course, uh, we should always have provision for first aid in case of broken skin or wound. Um, our institution should also be able to do counseling, give support, and assess the risk and benefits of the HIV uh, pro uh, exposure prophylaxis, explain the side effects, and e enhance adherence counseling. So we consult an expert. But for example, there's no expert or someone knowledgeable to counsel the patient. It should not hinder starting post-exposure prophylaxis, especially if your patient is really um, at high risk. Okay, so what are exposures that may warrant post-exposure prophylaxis? This is, these are parenteral or mucous membrane exposure, sexual exposure, splashes to the eye, nose, oral cavity, and following bodily fluids, which may uh, pose risk for HIV infection, blood, bloodstained saliva, breast milk, genital secretion, CSF, amniotic, rectal, peritoneal, uh, synovial, pericardial, or pleural fluids. And uh, what are exposures that does not require post-exposure prophylaxis when the exposed individual is already HIV positive yun pala siya na pala si patient number two <laughs> siya na pala yun diba? so of course hindi na naman niya kailangan if the patient is already um, taking ARTs so when the source is established to be HIV negative um, kasi we usually give this lang talaga if it's HIV positive no, or very high likelihood that your patient has HIV or the, the source patient, no? And exposure to body fluid that does not pose a significant uh, risk, for example, tear or non-bloodstained saliva, urine, or sweat. Kunyari, nakat yung gloves mo, nawaka mo yung BB ng patient. Hindi naman, it's may HIV siya. So it's not an indication, ha, to, ano, to be given post-exposure prophylaxis. So usually, we use three or more uh, post-exposure drugs at one time, uh, and we take it for four weeks. So, Adherence is very um, important and especially because uh, there are really side effects. So, kaya ka important yung counseling so that your healthcare worker who got a needle stick injury from an HIV patient will adhere to completing the four-week course and would know what to do if may ma-feel siya na anything. No? Alam niya kung ano yung gagawin niya. So, this is ano... Uh, um, the recommended, this is our DL, um, but actually this is not what we use in the Philippines. It's not yet readily available because the preferred HIV regimen is actually raltegravir no? plus truvada, uh, the tenofovir plus emtesitribine. But this is from the WHO, uh, the latest guideline, which was in 2013, would give preference to tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate or TDF plus lamivudine or emtricitabine no? um, as a backbone for the first-line treatment for adults. Um, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir is also recommended, but efavirenz, as we can see here, no, is also an alternative option. So in the Philippines, still, um, post-exposure prophylaxis na madalas ko nakikita is lamivudine, tenofovir, efavirenz. So I haven't used other regimens to my other patients. So follow-up appointments is very important. Um, again, should begin your PEP should begin within 72 hours of your exposure. 
Um, I've discussed that, the importance of testing, counseling, monitoring. I also ask your healthcare worker if uh, he or she has comorbidities so that we can check for possible drug-drug interactions with our ARPs. So what can our organization or healthcare institution do? So of course, occupational exposure is considered an, an urgent medical concern. So it's an emergency. Yeah? Don't be shy to call no matter what time of the day. If something happens, you can call your hip no? And this should be managed immediately after exposure. We should always review, you know, the guidelines on this. Train personnel in infection control procedures. So I think in most of the nurses, the man would know would have infection prevention um, seminars no prior to employment. So this is where the importance of knowing your IPC um, um, measures would come in. So again, you would remind always your personnel to report your occupation exposure. So yung mga hip ko, wag naman natin pagalitan yung mga ano natin, no? yung mga healthcare workers na nagkaroon ng needle stick injury. Or kung may mga question sila, hindi sila sure, um, let's just answer them pleasantly. No? And then we should develop and distribute written policies for the management of occupational um, exposures and promote the use of safely, uh, of safety devices to prevent sharp injuries. So to answer the last case, no, uh, for this, we should assess the nurse. We counsel and support kasi for sure, ano, nilamig na yan. Sobrang scared, no? Uh, what if malaman eventually na ano, ng ibang tao, tapos isipin meron siyang HIV. So would doon ulit pumapasok yung discrimination, no? Then we screen, no? Because we need to screen them, of course. Kasi yun, yun pala, bibigyan mo na takot siya pero hindi niya alam na HIV na rin pala siya. So we will also screen them. So that's included no in how we manage them. And then we prescribe the post exposure prophylaxis, we coordinate with the hack and then a uh, very important follow up. All right. So that's it. So just to give a summary, in the Philippines, no, we have around 33 new HIV patients per day, 95% of which are males with an average of uh, Average age of 28. Again, HIV testing is non-compulsory, should be voluntary after proper counseling, and sh there should be no work discrimination for PLHIV healthcare workers. All healthcare workers should be educated on HIV in the workplace. All needle stick injuries should be reported to the HIPCO as soon as possible. And post-exposure prophylaxis shall be initiated within 72 hours if exposed to HIV-confirmed patients. So these are my references and thank you for your kind consideration. Back to you, Doc Mark. Doc Mark, you're on, on mute. Yeah, thank you. Thank Ayaw. you, Dr. Monica. And uh, <laughs> Pinatagalan ko yung slide. <laughs> oh, matagalan masyado. <laughs> and thank you for discussing all these uh, very common issues that we encounter, especially regarding HIV in the workplace. Um, again, uh, HIV is, let's just say, a controversial issue, lalo na sa workplace, but uh, one way to address the stigma on HIV is to be more inclusive, to be more aware uh, about HIV and how we should help uh, these people living with HIV. Technically, those people who are living with HIV are not, are not those who only have the disease. We ourselves are also people living with HIV because we live with them in a community and we are considered people also living with HIV. Um, we still have like 12 minutes, 10 minutes for a Q&A. If you have any questions to Dr. Monica, just uh, um, put it in the chat box, or if you want to ask it personally, just raise your hand and unmute your microphone. Um, I have a few questions here um, regarding the needle stick injury. In this case, in the case uh, you presented, Dr. Monica, the patient was uh, is known to have HIV. But what if the, the nurse uh, had a needle stick injury and she does not really know and no one knows the status of that patient? Um, can they test the patient for HIV? Just to, just to make it sure that the patient does not or, do, uh, or does not have HIV. Well, yeah. Um, 
So the first thing to do is to report to the HIPCO. And actually, we have also to test the patient, but we have to explain what happened. No? Uh, but of course, there's ano dan, two sides of the coin. If the patient will not have himself tested for HIV or if the patient consents to be tested. So it's easy already if the patient would give the consent. No? Uh, but it's difficult if the patient doesn't want to be tested for HIV. Um, so for instances where we are not yet sure, um, we can actually still give post-exposure prophylaxis. Yes. And the nearest uh, place where they can get the pep, the PEP is... Well, here in Santa Rosa, we can get from the city health office. Yes, um, it's unfortunately it's not available yet in Qualimed, uh, in Qualimed Santa Rosa. But uh, we can actually have, we can actually request from DOH to have uh, uh, a few tablets of uh, of antiretrovirals, uh, just in case there's a need to start PEP to any of our healthcare workers. Um, there's another question: If I'm a surgeon and I am a PLHIV, should I uh, tell my patient that I have HIV before I could perform surgery? No, you, you don't have to tell your patients that you have HIV. And we actually have ano, several doc surgeons talaga in the cutting field who are, ano, but the, the ideal, especially if you will, uh, do, if you want to still do category 3, medyo marami din kasi yung category 3 ngayon. Mm -hmm. no? So our goal is that their, their viral load be less than 500. But yes. you don't have to tell them. Yes. As long as there is no risk of transmission and the risk of transmission is very low if your viral load is undetectable. So there is no uh, ethical issues there, actually. Yes. Um, I have another question. Should the attending physician inform the nurses and other uh, co-managing doctors of the status of the patient, but the patient um, asks the attending physician, do not disclose my status to anyone in this hospital. What should the attending physician do? Um, hmm. So if, if the patient doesn't want the others to know, uh, for as long as uh, they are the, health, the other healthcare workers handling the patient, for example, you're a co-managing doctor, uh, and then you will not do any procedure naman, like you would just, just do your daily rounds and manage the patient, then um, it's not needed. Unless there will be at risk yeah. to the mm -hmm. other healthcare workers, then you have to tell them. It's actually included in the compulsory na you have to tell if yeah. you that there's risk for the others, you can yeah. tell them. And also, all healthcare workers should practice the confidentiality. Yeah. Uh, so well, reg regardless of man kung HIV or not, we all should we should always uh, practice confidentiality. Yeah. So yun nga. Uh, just po mapaso kasi it's compulsory. So you can actually tell them. But since we know that there is um, such a thing as medical confidentiality, it's something that we should always observe. Then you know na how to handle them. May isang akong patient ngayon, eh, sabi ko sa station, huwag bawas buwasan niyo pagiging marites, baka meron makarinig. Bawal yan. <laughs> oh. Oh, so, lalo na... Okay, very lalo, sensitive. Uh, Oo, oh, lalo na sa mga elevator. just ko, dyan na ka, makakarinig <laughs> ng mga stories. Kasi akala nila wala na kayo ng iba. Anyways, any other questions? Um, There's okay, one. Yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I think this is from Dr. Joseph. Uh, healthcare workers does not have to divulge that he has HIV that he has HIV before treating his patient. But what if the patient asks <laughs> if you have HIV? What if the? Bakit naman mag ano? Oh, bakit <laughs> Oh, for me, for example, if I were the one PLHIV, um, and I don't think there's any way that I can infect that patient, then I don't have to disclose to them. Yeah, yeah. Or I could say, uh, why are you asking me? <laughs> um, what I could tell you is that whether I'm HIV positive or not, that doesn't make me less of a doctor and uh, uh, decreases my capability to treat you as a doctor. Correct. Correct. Okay, so any other questions from the group from uh, from uh, the health uh, from the Qualimet Health Network, um, and hopefully you know uh, Qualimet Health Network uh, will be able to also have a treatment hub facility.
for for HIV because we are seeing really a lot yeah. of uh, cases now. And what's really um, um, uh, What's really uh, not frustrating, but very, very sad is that most of our cases are really young adults. So from the 15 to 24, 24 to 35 years old. So these are young adults, young professionals, and they're having this disease. And um, they're fresh out of college, trying to get a job, trying to make a living, and yet um, they are limited by this illness. And uh, hopefully will not... Uh, um, discriminate them uh, and then we'll have an open mind and accept them because you know they're they're they they, they just have this illness and uh, that doesn't make them less of a person okay so yeah. if, uh, yes if there are no other questions I'll, uh, I'll give the floor back to Bambi Bambi Thank you. Thank I, you very much hold on. <laughs> What if there's a news online that a doctor is HIV positive and kumalat po sa workplace? Ano po ang dapat gawin ng HR? If there's news na may... Wala. Wala. Oh. Wala lang, no? Wala. Oh. Oh, oh, we do not honor it. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. Oo, kung marites lang siya, ang oh, chismis oh, lang siya talaga. So, <laughs> so, 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 you know... um. And again, um, as we need to protect also uh, these people with HIV, especially in our workplace, because um, sila din naman exposed to a lot of infection. So as much as possible, we should take care of them. Uh, and, uh, and we need to make sure that they are also safe in the workplace. Okay, okay. Bambi, are there other you. questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much again, Drs. Monica and Dr. Mark. May I just say in behalf of everyone, we love this concept. We love this repartee between the both of you. Oh, I like <laughs> and the word. The case. Repartee. <laughs> <laughs> and we love the case management and the case handling because it's very relatable to us employees. No, especially there was a HR, so syempre ako relate ako doon. <laughs> So, may HR, may nurse, may wrong ANSI, then may mga doctors. So, we're very, very thankful, doctors uh, Monica and Dr. Mark. Thank you very much for that very, very interesting and educational uh, lecture from the both of you. So, um, uh, so to actually just to close this session but prior uh, we'll we'll have some announcements a little while so may we call on uh, sige let's do this first um we'd like to uh, present the certificate of appreciation to dr monica pia r montesilio for her expertise and valuable role as a resource speaker during the webinar entitled ending the stigma living and working with hiv given this 20 second day of April 2022 via Zoom virtual event, signed our OIC Vice President, Attorney Nirmala Vanguardia, our Group Chief Operating Officer, Ms. Margaret Bengzon, and our President and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Jimmy Ismael. Thank you, Doctor. And also, uh, we'd like to, uh, the Quality Med Health Network presents this as well, a uh, certificate of appreciation to Dr. Mark Christopher Yu Pasayan for his expertise and valuable role as moderator during the webinar entitled in Ending the Stigma, Living and Working with HIV given this 22nd day of uh, April 2022 via Zoom virtual event signed by our executives. So thank you very much again, Dr. Monica and Dr. Mark. Um, sana hindi kayo magsawa sa amin to teach us. <laughs> so uh, before I give uh, our closing uh uh, the our doctor who will be giving our doc closing remarks. Let me just remind everybody of the two other sessions that we will be having for this QHN series. Our next is next week, April 29, for HEPA B in the workplace, our session four, and our session five is on May 5 on mental health issues 
in the workplace. Ayan. And of course, we'd like to thank uh, PSQM Dr. Gina uh, Nazareth who is here. And I saw the presence of our uh, other MDs, Dr. Wu, Nama ba ang ating, uh, medical directors from Iloilo. And of course, um, the person who will be closing the session is another MD, our medical director from our uh, legacy hospital, DMMC, Dr. Conrad Narsil Bimalalu. Dr. Conrad. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Ang bilis niyong magpalit ng ano. <laughs> uh, Galing na day. <laughs> parang gulatan lang pero ang bilis niyong magpalit. But, <laughs> well, actually, uh, this is quite an interesting um, a lecture. I actually was surprised to know that there are 33 new cases of HIV per day. And that uh, amounts to around 12,000 per year. So medyo mm, uh, alarming, very alarming. And uh, a lot of our workers uh, that uh, could be exposed to this new cases medyo is bothersome. But uh, yes, this, this I would have to agree with Bambi. You know? This is a very good uh, style of making a lecture hindi siya lecture lang talaga it's just a it's a question and answer thing and so i think uh, we get a lot more from this kind of lectures than just a regular lecture so thank you very much dr monica it's the first time that i saw and i met you kaya lang online lang no magpractice ka rin dito sa DMMC kasama mo rin si mark <laughs> So uh, yes, this is a very difficult uh, situation. If, if for the HR, if the healthcare worker is infected, this is really a very, very sensitive. And especially sa hospital, parang sa hospital, lahat na bubulgar eh. Uh, so it's really very difficult. This is a very, very challenging uh, topic for HR. Although, of course, Uh, as far as I know, wala, wala pa namang masyadong cases sa hospital. No? But if it would have or we would have one, it's going to be a very difficult subject. So thank you very much, Dr. Manika, for enlightening us on what we should do, for enlightening our HR and what we should do. And we had 112 participants. So thank you very much to everybody who attended this. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you will know what to do if the situation arises. So thank you very much. I don't have to make this uh, long. Magsyadong magaling sila Bambi to make a new poster. And Gina, takot ko na lang sa'yo. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope uh, you would enjoy the rest thank of the Thank you, day. Conrad. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Conrad. Si Day ang gumawa ng iyong addition. <laughs> so, again, <laughs> so again, guys, this has been uh, uh, recorded. This is a recorded session. So you can uh, refer it to our friends in uh, Qualimed also uh, for those who were not able to join us. And again, Dr. Conrad, we actually reached uh, the high of 114 in attendance in this session. So uh, one oh, of the okay, most attended fun. so far. Uh, <laughs> uh, so far in our series. So again, guys, thank you very much for attending. We hope to see you again next week for our next session under HEPA-B. Doctors, thank you for your expertise. Maraming salamat po. Ingat po sa pauwi, guys. And have a, have a good weekend. Great weekend, everyone. Bye!